Well, good morning again. Today, uh, I have the challenge of not preaching my full time, and I'm going to only preach about 20 minutes, Lord willing. Uh, we still have one more special thing we want to do uh, today to encourage you and to also ask you to pray. Um, if you can switch to my PowerPoint, please, that would be helpful. Uh, hopefully, it's on the screen. Um, but if you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter uh, 11. Today, we will focus on uh, verses 22 through 33. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 33. And the title of my message this morning is entitled, A Mountain Moving Faith. A Mountain Moving Faith. And it looks like they're having trouble with my PowerPoint, uh, so we'll just keep going here. But I want you just for a moment, I want you to evaluate your faith. On a scale of 1 to 10, I want you to think about your faith and just evaluate it just for a moment. This series, we've talked a lot about faith. Uh, we've talked about, uh, for instance, in chapter 1, we talked about a leper, and the leper said to Jesus, Jesus, if you're willing, he was showing his faith, he said, are you willing, and he said, yes, I am willing, and Jesus healed him. Uh, you'll recall in chapter 2, remember when the friends, they carried uh, the lame man who couldn't walk to Jesus. And remember, they lowered him through the ceiling. Remember what Jesus said? Because of your faith, because of your faith, you are healed. Um, do you remember in chapter five when the woman who had the issue of blood, bleeding for years, she reached out and she touched the garment and Jesus was so moved by her faith, right? You wrote about Jairus' daughter. Jairus' daughter was dead, and what did Jesus say to her? He said, stop being afraid and start believing, right? Now, I ask myself, as we've gone through all of these stories, what is your faith like? Jesus was able to say, hey, these people's faith that we have discovered and that we have studied, their faith is very strong. But we also see in the Gospel of Mark, we see individuals whose faith were weak, do you remember when Jesus came into the boat? There was storming. Jesus is walking on the water. The Bible said that he was just going to walk past them, right, in the midst of this storm. But he had to get in the boat. You know why? Because they were of little faith. Remember, Jesus constantly was challenging them. Have stronger faith. The biggest rebuke, though, in the book of Mark was in chapter 9 when Jesus said, oh, this unbelieving generation. Why am I sharing all this? Why am I reviewing all of this? Because we've been in this sermon series now for almost 40 weeks, and we have been learning through the stories of Jesus about the importance of having faith. And Jesus wants all of us this morning to have a mountain-moving faith. And so ask yourself, where's your faith this morning? Would you rate yourself a little bit closer to one would you say that your faith is average, or would you say that you have strong faith like some of these examples that have been mentioned? Well, we're going to learn today the importance in Mark chapter 11 to have mountain-moving faith, right? Look at, look at what it says in verse 22. It says, have faith in God, Jesus answers. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Verse 27 says, they arrived again in Jerusalem and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him and they said, by what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you authority to do this? And Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. And they discussed it among themselves, and they said, well, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. In verse 33, they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these 
things. Let's talk about a mountain moving faith today. I just want to talk about two things, two challenges. And first of all, I want to share this. A mountain moving faith is powerful. It's powerful. Okay, so we have to talk about this type of faith that leads to power. Okay, look at specifically the key. Verse 22 says you have to have faith in God. Listen carefully, because if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. The secret to moving mountains is not your faith. The secret to moving mountains is your faith in a powerful God. There's a difference. Jesus isn't just saying to you and I this morning, try harder, do better, believe more, have a better faith. No, what he is saying to us today is where are you placing your faith? Is your faith in yourself or is your faith in an all-powerful God? I was thinking about my day yesterday. Uh, I coached soccer and we were on a bus that looked a lot like this and our game was an hour and a half away And so we're there on the bus. I'm in the very front seat of the bus. The team's behind us. And I just decided to close my eyes. And the next thing you know, I'm dozing off. You know, those very comfortable coach buses. And next thing I know, after I fell asleep, I felt us hitting the rivet strips. And the bus broke down. And I remember thinking after we resolved the issue and we were fine, we made it to our game in time, we won. By the way, we're in the final four. But anyway, that's followed. That's for matter. It's all about the assistant coach, you know. I'm not even the head coach. I basically carry balls and cheer guys on. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is I, I thought to myself, I had enough faith in this bus and in this driver to go to sleep, right? And then after we hit the rivet strips, I, my faith went away, and I woke up, and I was nervous, right? After the game, we were gone all day. I didn't eat. And I made a really bad choice on the way home. I went to five guys. Really bad choice. A really delicious choice, but a really bad choice. And if you've ever been to five guys, I don't go there often, but I was at five guys, and you're you're there at five guys, and you can watch the people make your food. Like, you know, they give you peanuts, and you just sit there and you watch them make your food. And I was watching the dude make my food, and I'm like, dude, can't even make his hair nice. And I'm like, in my heart, put on gloves. Please put on gloves. And I'm watching this guy like wipe his nose and yeah, right? How much faith do we put in cooks and all these people that make our food? And I was just thinking, as I go through my day, I put so much faith in different things, don't you? But no, we're talking about faith in God. Have faith in God. So can I ask you a couple questions real quick this morning? Do you have the faith of a mustard seed? Because in the parallel count, Jesus teaches something in Matthew that we need to remind ourselves that it's not about the size of your faith. It's not about having a big faith. It's about a little faith, listen carefully, in a very big God. Jesus says if you have the faith of a mustard seed, it can move mountains. It can do the impossible if you have a little bit of faith in a very big God. Don't switch this around. Don't, switch, don't think that you have to have you know, more willpower and more strength. No, it's a belief solely in God. So ask yourself, do I believe in what he has said? See, a powerful faith believes in what God has said. And that's what we're learning here in this text Last week, we learned about Jesus cursing a fig tree, and I want you to remind yourself in verse 21, this is the verse that we ended with last week, Peter points out to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. He was shocked. He was surprised. He didn't believe at the time when Jesus said it that it would happen. His faith wasn't that powerful yet, but Jesus points out that what he says will happen. And so we have to ask ourselves, do I have a powerful faith in a very big God this morning? Well, it starts with believing in what he says, believing in his word. Church, we have to act and live and behave 
like this. If Jesus says it, we can count on it. We do not need to question it. If he said it, it's a promise, it will happen. That is a faith in a world that has flipped everything upside down. Second question we have to ask ourselves is, do I believe in what he can do? If you want to have a powerful faith in God, not only are we believing in his word, but we're believing in his ultimate strength. I want you to see this. He says, I tell you, if anyone says to a mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that they will see what happened, it will be done for them. Is Jesus literally saying to you and I that if we have enough faith that we can rip up, in this case, the Mount of Olives and throw it into the sea? He was speaking here in hyperbole. He was speaking as an illustration. His point is this, and don't miss this. He's saying, what is the impossible mountain that is in your life? What is the thing in your life that you have tried to move on your own human strength, but you cannot? Faith is in a God who is bigger than you, stronger than you, and has the power, this is the point, to do the impossible in your life. So do you and I believe that he can move the impossible mountains in our life? Do we believe he can do what he says he can do? And then number three, we have to ask ourselves, do I believe who he is? Do I believe who he is? I love this because the last part of our passage this morning talks about authority. Again, you have to tie all this together because he's going back to last week's lesson. He's talking about the tree, but he's also reminding him about the temple because the critics are saying, who's given you authority to flip tables in the temple? Who's given you authority to tell us what we can do and not do when it comes to money exchange and to selling sacrificial animals? Who's given you authority? And he says, okay, I'll talk to you about that. Uh, Let's talk about John the Baptist. They all believed in John the Baptist, right? Right? And they were basically saying, okay, Jesus was trapping them. He's like, okay, do you believe in John the Baptist? Do you believe that he was a prophet? And of course, they knew the answer was yes. Well, John the Baptist talked about Jesus. So if they said yes, then he, Jesus just said, well, then just listen to what John the Baptist says. Because John the Baptist said, I had authority. But they couldn't answer the question. They knew that Jesus once again outsmarted them. And so they chose to play the card of ignorance. But you and I know that Jesus has absolute authority. Listen carefully. In the Gospel of Mark, think about all the times that we have studied his authority. He had authority over nature, authority over demons, authority over diseases, authority to forgive, authority to have powerful teaching. And the list goes on and on. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, if we want a powerful faith, it's not just believing in the word of God and his incredible strength, but we have to look at Jesus as the sole, absolute authority of our lives. Amen? That's how you have a powerful faith. You're going to say, hey, listen, this is what God said, so I believe he can do it because he's in control. He has absolute authority. And then we have to ask ourselves this other question real quick this morning is not only does a mountain moving faith, is it powerful, but it's also prayerful. And we have to evaluate our prayer this morning. We have to ask ourselves, why is my life not as powerful in Jesus as I would hope it to be? I mean, I believe in his word and I believe in his strength And I believe in his absolute rule, but why is things not happening the way that I think that they should, perhaps? And you have to evaluate and ask yourself, how's my prayer life? Because prayer is the key to tapping into power. I woke up this morning, I love my Apple Watch because it tells me I got like literally two more minutes right now. But I love it, but I woke up this morning, it was completely dead. I forgot to put it on the charger. Have you ever done that? So this morning, this, you know, I was up at 6 o'clock, and I charged my phone from 6 to whatever, and I got a full battery life. And the point is this. 
Do you want power in your life? It's a direct result to how much you pray. Praying is how you tap into the power of God. If I want my watch to work the way it's supposed to work, it has to tap into a power source. If I want my life to work the way God has designed my life to work, it has to tap into a power source. So if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the way we tap into God's power is through prayer, a complete dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So ask yourself, how am I praying? Jesus teaches us in this passage that if you want an effective prayer life, number one, you have to pray without doubt. Notice he's saying, if you want an effective prayer life that taps into the power of God, number one, you have to remove doubt from your heart. That's what he says. Further study, James chapter one. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. But don't ask with doubt. Ask with faith. Because that prayer is effective. Number two, we have to ask ourselves, am I praying selfishly? See, one of the problems with this passage is there's a wrong teaching that's out there that if you simply believe it, you will receive it. Here's the key. God wants you to have faith, okay? But it also has to be part of his will, amen? It cannot be a selfish prayer. We learned this from Jesus in the garden we learn this from this passage as well. What he's saying there is whatever you ask in prayer, what you need to add here is according to God's will. That is consistent all throughout Scripture. Let me give you a verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Write that down. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 tells us that whatever we ask according to his will. He will give it to us. So it's not about just me, you know, mustering up enough faith, believing, and then receiving. No, it's about saying, okay, God, you can, you can, but is it your will? There's no doubt in my mind you can remove this physical disease. There's no doubt in my mind you can take care of this relational problem. There's no doubt in my mind that you can solve anything that I consider impossible, because you're powerful enough, but here's the question, is it your will? Is it your will? And so we can't pray selfishly. That's why Jesus taught his disciples to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What does he say next? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's not just teaching them to repeat a prayer that means nothing. He's teaching them to pray a prayer of principle that says, when I pray, I'm praying selflessly. I'm praying not for my will, but for your will. And then finally, notice that he says in the passage that if you want effective prayer, it has to be a prayer where your heart and your attitude is forgiving. Listen carefully. This might be hard for some of you to hear. If you are harboring bitterness or if you are holding on to something where you are not forgiving another person, listen carefully, God will not hear your prayer. You will not tap into his incredible power if there is unforgiveness in your heart. That's what he says in verse 25. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. Why? So that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. The point is this. If you've truly filled up on the forgiveness of God, and guess what, you didn't deserve it, I didn't deserve it, and you truly have Jesus' forgiveness in you, then Jesus' forgiveness should flow out of you. And so, not based on your power, but based on his power, you can forgive. You say, Pastor Jeff, you don't know what happened in my life. You're right, I don't. But I do know the power of Jesus is bigger than what happened to your life. And his forgiveness in you and through you can lead to forgiveness of others. That's power. To forgive people when they don't deserve it, right? So ask yourself, a mountain-moving faith is powerful. A mountain-moving faith is prayerful. Now reverse it. In order to tap into the power of God, you must pray. How do I pray? Without doubt, without selfishness, with forgiveness, 
And when I pray that way, believing in the word of God and the power of God and believing in the authority of God, power will be seen in my life. I'll just close with this illustration, Panera. I haven't gone to Panera, by the way, since, since uh, COVID, by the way. Panera used to be my favorite place. Um, I stopped going to Panera, and they had to close down local locations because I supported the entire store. I got to brag on my daughter real quick. My daughter was um, or, or is in a Bible study uh, that takes place in Panera, I believe, on Monday nights. Um, some of you are aware of this. Some of you are here. And uh, my, my daughter came home so excited, and she said, you, you're not going to believe what happened at Panera tonight. And I said, they gave you food in a timely manner? <laughs> That's so mean. <laughs> they said, no, we were, we were studying the Bible, and we were praying, and, and guess what our prayer request was? We prayed, said, God, would you, would you do a powerful work that somebody would approach us at some point during this week and notice because of the fact that we're different, that, that we follow Jesus, that we believe in his word, et cetera, et cetera. Would, would you, Lord, just, you know, instead of us going to people and asking them what they think of Jesus, would you just allow someone who, just to come up to us and ask us, hey, I noticed you're different. That was their prayer in Panera. And they say amen. And a minute later, Two girls walk up to the group and said, hey, we've noticed you here a couple of weeks, and we noticed you guys are studying the Bible. There's something different about you guys. And we were just wondering if you had a few minutes to tell us what it was all about. Amen. That's the power of prayer. Amen. And so we want to close the service a little bit different. We want to give you one more prayer request. I'm going to ask Sam to come up here. We have a couple in our church that's been here. They'll explain. I'm going to invite them up as well. Sam, I don't want to steal any thunder. But we are going to turn off the feed once again. Thank you for watching us online. Please put away your phones once again. But the last 10 minutes, we just want you to hear this story, and then we're done. We're not going to have another song. All right? Thanks, Sam.